October 7, 1849, a man appears near a tavern in the city of Baltimore, seemingly extremely drunk, barely able to talk, staggering, babbling, dirty clothes, unkempt hair, wild eyes. Well, it turns out this man was Edgar Allan Poe someone who was aware of Poe, who knew Poe a bit, uh, was able to recognize him and arranged for Poe to get medical attention. It turns out that the clothes he was wearing were not his own clothes. And once he was put into a hospital bed, he constantly said the name Reynolds over and over before dying not too long after. Now, Poe's not very old, um, in his 40s, and he had last been seen a week earlier. He was making his way from Richmond to New York City, and somehow ended up in Baltimore, drunk, perhaps drunk to the point of killing himself with drink. No one really knows what happened to Poe, how he ended up in Baltimore, how he ended up so drunk and delirious, and what ultimately killed him. These will remain mysteries forever, probably. But I'm bringing this incident up, sad though it is, to focus mainly on the fact that Poe died in another man's clothing. That at his very last moment, Edgar Allan Poe is not quite Edgar Allan Poe. He appears as a essentially nameless drunk wearing clothes not his own. Well, this is just a culmination of a theme that runs throughout Poe's life, the theme of taking on uh, identities other than his given one. He was born Edgar, uh, Edgar Poe to uh, a woman, man, David Poe, Liza Poe, they were actors. Uh, when Poe was very young, the father just runs off, disappears. Uh, the mother dies of tuberculosis. And at a young age, Poe is uh, taken up by the Allen family from Richmond. He's never officially adopted by the Allen family, but they do take him in, become his guardians. But ultimately, Poe has a very vexed relationship with Mr. Allen. But at this point, Poe becomes Edgar Allen Poe, second name. Uh, when Poe goes off to an English boarding school, he is known as Edgar Allen. Uh, after Poe leaves the boarding school, spends a little bit of time at the University of Virginia, doesn't go well, he gambles, drinks, basically is kicked out, runs up huge debts. He joins the army under the name of Edgar A. Perry. And soon after that, he was telling people his name was Henri Le René. When he published his first book of poems, he said these, these poems were by a Bostonian. He did not sign his names to his first book of poems, a Bostonian. And when he first published The Raven in a literary magazine, he published it under the name of Quarles. <laughs> Quarles. So look at all these pseudonyms, look at all these names, look at all these identities that Poe takes on in his actual life. Now, why am I bringing this up? Mainly because in his short stories, Poe is constantly exploring the nature of self, the nature of identity, uh, our ability to tell who we are and how we are able to tell if, the difference in ourselves and others. For Poe, it's not easy to establish an I. It's not easy to establish a subjectivity. Um, he seems to be saying, based on his own life, that we are not one set person all the time, but we are constantly playing different roles. It's as if we are, even without trying to, taking on different identities. There's no stable self, no stable I. We're fluid, uh, performative. One day you're Ed Gray Perry, one day you're Henri Le Rene. Uh, does this mean we have what we might call these days a split personality? Maybe, but I think Poe is, is more interested in the idea that not having a stable self can be painful. It can cause restlessness, nervousness, insecurity. But at the same time, not having a stable self can be an invitation to play, experiment, 
move around different identities to expand your consciousness and give yourself more opportunity to create. Poe's most famous short stories almost all have a narrator who is unidentified, an I. And usually this I is not clear about his origin. Usually this I is not clear about what is real and what is not. And usually this I is not clear about what his future should be. For instance, think of the story of William Wilson, which opens up with the narrator saying, call me for now, William Wilson, <laughs> which suggests that he's not really William Wilson, but that's a name he's taking right now. And as William Wilson, he meets another person named William Wilson. And this other person named William Wilson um, is constantly thwarting his uh, goals. The goals are nefarious, albeit. Uh, but there's a sense that there, there are two William Wilsons out there at odds with one another. And the only way that the narrator is able to destroy this other William Wilson is ultimately by killing himself. So we have an I who seems to be taking on an identity, a role, a mask, and using this identity to dramatize basically what it feels like to be a human being. What does it feel like? It feels like there are these other voices of mysterious origin who are constantly limiting us, undercutting us, um, pushing against us. And the only way it seems to sort of move beyond these limitations of the physical world is to transcend the physical world. Well, how can you do that? Well, you can die. <laughs> and again, the, the narrator in seemingly killing William Wilson uh, ends up killing himself and therefore is pushed beyond the realm of what we can experience with our five senses to an unmapped realm, a terra incognita. And there, beyond any kind of constraint of an I or identity, who knows what there is. Maybe there's nothing. Maybe there's annihilation. Um, but maybe there's fullness. We, we don't know. I bring this up because in so many other stories, the, the, the tale concludes with the narrator pushing beyond what is known into something unknown. Um, but the narrator almost always is this restless I searching for stability or identity. Think about MS found the bottle. Um, the narrator says, here I am. I don't really want to say much about my past. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give you a few details about my life. But basically, the thing that is true of me is I'm restless. I'm, I can't be still. I can't be secure. And the story is about this person going from a normal trade ship to some sort of bizarre ghost ship that seems to have been sailing the oceans forever um, <clears throat> and whose captain seems to be a double of the narrator as, as if somehow this ship is a reflection of the narrator's own restless quest for some kind of truth or identity or, or place to rest. Uh, but it turns out that on this boat all the, all the maps and, and the uh, navigational tools are obsolete. They're rusty. So the ship seems to be beyond any sort of predictable route. And the story ends, um, it seems, with the ship going down into a huge maelstrom right at the South Pole, going again into a world that's not been mapped, going beyond the realm of the five senses, suggesting that the quest for selfhood um, ultimately in this world will remain unfulfilled, given that a self is so um, unstable. And the only possibility for gaining any kind of stable truth is to go beyond the known. But again, what happens there? Uh, we don't know. The story ends. Does this, does this narrator go into annihilation? Does he go into fullness? We don't know. So pay attention to this in the stories of the narrator, almost always nameless, uh, trying to seek identity, um, but almost always ending up in a, in a being pushed to a realm uh, that is beyond the known. And of course, it seems that Poe himself, um, in his own life, had that same kind of restlessness, searching for himself, searching for solace, searching for stability. But ultimately, what happens? He ends up staggeringly drunk, uh, wearing another man's clothes, 
and, and dies seemingly without uh, really any self-knowledge at all.